things I'd like to talk about, I decided never again to use the word strategic, tactical, or doctrine. And uh, the word strategic air plan came, we were preparing for a JCS uh, CENTCOM exercise at Eglin. And I had already worked with General Schwarzkopf on things like push gas and uh, some other things. And I said, I need to give you a strategic air plan. And he said, great. And then we went to that exercise, and suddenly the in intel for the exercise became the real will intel with uh, Saddam invading Kuwait. So boom, we wind up going over. And uh, so that's where the word strategic came from. The second is uh, the uh, Army briefing to the Washington. That was a set up plan so that they, at Force Golf, get the 7th Corps. Remember, at that briefing, if you read that briefing, you heard the Army briefer at the end say, General Forscop does not recommend this plan. And that, all that was was maneuvering to get another corps. And uh, I'm sure he and Powell worked that out. Uh, guard Reserve. Do you know how you can tell a Guard Reserve guy when you're deployed in the war? They're the ones that need a haircut. <laughs> they fly and fight just like everybody else. But occasionally I'd stop and say, you need a haircut. And still, you don't understand, sir. I'm in the guard. <laughs> I said, where is your ass? And he said, well, we're at Al Opera. I said, get a haircut. <laughs> uh, Israel uh, was very concerned, and rightfully so, and was becoming a real uh, sort of a, a pain in the, uh, wherever you get pains. <laughs> and uh, so uh, it, course, the answer was, of course, the point of the Patriots. And while the Patriot was said by the scientific experts is not working, remember if Scud is a psychological weapon, well the Patriot is a psychological antidote, and it worked just fine that way. But the Israeli and I knew Benan, we worked together before. And so when uh, things got rough, they had me send Tom Olson, my deputy, up to Israel, and they got this beat the hell out of him up there. And I said, Tom, you tell him that if they want to fly, I will know it because I can see their air bases from the AWACS picture. And we'll just pull our forces back and they can go in there and do whatever they want to. And they get done, uh, we'll go back to kill them in. And I said, you also might tell them and inform them they're gonna to have to go through Jordan, which will bring Jordan into the war. Because if they come through Saudi Arabia, I will intercept them and shoot them down. Now, if the State Department or the Pentagon knew I was saying, making statements like that, uh, they'd all, they'd, be in the they'd get their little shirts and what, but uh, I said it, and I was ready to do it, and uh, it seemed to work. The thing, there was a confluence of leadership, if you've heard, and I'm not going to repeat it all. Uh, President Bush, we went to Camp David and briefed him. Uh, he didn't answer, uh, he didn't answer any questions, and uh, first Powell briefed, then Schwarzkopf briefed, then I briefed which meant I was left standing by the slide that was there. <clears throat> and so if the question from the cabinet came up and Powell didn't want to answer, he'd look up at Norm. And when Norm didn't want to answer, he'd look up at me. And so I'd wind up answering the one they didn't want to answer. And I thought some of the questions were the dumbest questions I've ever heard. But then later, those were the same questions the press kept asking the president. So uh, I think that was the purpose. But when he started asking questions, it became apparent that uh, he had two things he was totally concerned about. One is casualties, and that's casualties on both sides, as it turned out. And second, coalition. He wanted a good coalition. And so those became our driving aspects when we deployed them. Uh, that Sunday, we met him on Friday. Uh, the other thing is, of course, he, uh, he really <coughs> gave us a goal, the first goal was defense the GCC, the second goal was implicit, was liberate Kuwait. But both those goals were militarily achievable, and that shows a certain amount of difference. We too often, the political leadership turns to a military solution for a problem that the military can solve. And so I think that anybody in the national security apparatus from here on out, they ought to say, Mr. President, uh, you want this done? Well, I'm telling you, the military can't do it. And uh, I think the military has an obligation to stand up and say that from time to time. And too often they're afraid. Cheney was great. He was very open. 
He knew everything was going on. He used to love to bug Powell. And he, I don't know why he did it that way. It didn't bother me if he wanted to do that. It's fine with me. But when, he, when he'd interrogate you, he didn't ask you like a superior person trying to show how much more he knew about a subject or try to embarrass you. He wanted to know the information. And you could argue with him. Uh, we had a, a big discussion on the uh, biological weapons. Powell was great. I went to National War College with Powell. I've known Powell. He is probably the finest politician I've ever seen. He does not get caught on anything. And uh, he, uh, quite frankly, understood Goldwater's Nichols. And that is really the reason he fired him. Now, Cheney's fired him, but Powell told Cheney to do it. And uh, it wasn't anything but Mike Dugan did that was horrible. Mike Dugan <coughs> was trying to promote the Air Force. And, and all he did is explain what, how to fight a war. Every airman knows how to fight a war. There's no <coughs> secret. Get control of the air, go out there and, and hit them where they're most uh, important. And uh, I have I had no problem with the firing Dugan, but that's be, uh, only because Mike is uh, was not sensitive to cold water things, and uh, that was uh, key to the whole operation. Uh, Sorskov Sorskov was extremely intelligent, and that's often hard to find. Okay. <laughs> uh, and the other thing is, he knew he didn't know air power. When he was going to have to go up to Camp David, I was flying up to Langley, and he, I got recalled, went down, flew down to McDill. And he went in and he said, would you help my staff build an air campaign? I said, sure. So I go in there to do it. Well, the J-3's an airman, and he doesn't want me around. So, fine. He, he's going to present his briefing. So at 5 o'clock at night in Sporskov, I'm sitting next to him. The Army guy gets up and briefs what we do in a an ground campaign against the Iraqis. And obviously, Sporskov would hand such. He would love to be beamed and all that. So then the air guy gets up to talk about the air, and I could see the fire coming out of Sporskov's ears because it was a disaster. And so I turned to John Sforskoff and I said, excuse me, sir, if I was going to brief the president, here's what I'd tell him. And I laid out you know, what we could do and how we do it. And he said, fine, you come and brief the president. I thought, oh, please, what have I done? <laughs> and so the, that day, uh, they stopped in at Shaw, picked me up, and took me, and we went to Camp David. how I went up there. Well, <clears throat> Who, who do we thank for, for this story? First of all, I think you have to thank Bill Creech. <coughs> Bill Creech took over Tag Head for, what, six years, something like that. And he was an absolute fanatic about combat readiness. And what he did, he fixed maintenance and he fixed supply structurally and with the way he did business organization. <coughs> and we didn't lose the story, to my knowledge, or supply. And we'd have uh, wings fly three missions an airplane a day, and they'd be 100% in commission afterwards. Because the people were motivated, they were trained, they were equipped, and they had the means which to do it. Uh, his ORIs, everybody got outstanding or had something on the ORIs because we knew what was expected. And so we trained at that level. What was expected was putting the bomb on target. And we did that. The flag exercises, obviously Dixon started red flag, but Creech added uh, a bunch of other flags uh, to include green flag, which emphasized electronic warfare. Uh, he also pounded decentralization. You were held responsible, and you were not to be uh, told what to do by headquarters. So example, as a wing commander, I had an organization, I had a budget. And if I wanted to spend my money doing something else, that was okay with Creech, and that budget director at headquarters better not call me on the phone, or he'd have his tail in the crack. On the other hand, if I used that money unwisely, or we didn't get the effect of being combat ready, I was gone. <coughs> and so, uh, believe me, the decentralization aspect came all the way down to building the ATO. Uh, Buster went down and briefed every air crew on the first two and a half days, and I said, what are we doing wrong, what are we doing right? And uh, uh, we've lost that. 
we've lost that idea of holding, giving people authority, letting them make decisions, and uh, let the people be responsible. Uh, I have to go plug for Buster. Buster's a bull in the China shop. Not many people like him. That doesn't bother him, I'm sure. <laughs> but I tell you, he created a real team in the Black Bull. And he had everybody on there from Army, Navy, Air Force, anybody could walk in the door and Buster kidnap them, hold them in chains. <laughs> and they built the most complex air taxing order, and they did it day after day after day. And there's no doubt about it. Now, on day three, the air taxing order was not nearly as good as the one they worked on for months. But it got better and better and better as they learned to live in the chaos of war. And uh, I, I have a deep appreciation for what Buster did, and I don't think he gets enough credit. Uh, we were prepared. I talked about uh, the readiness that uh, Creech gave us. We also had the Reagan budget. Uh, this inspection, which, what's this term? Inspiration. I, what's your title? Your title for the comments? No. What is it? Inflection. 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 So I asked my nine year old granddaughter, what is inflection? I said, Dad, that's, Grandpa, that's where the curve is it's either highest or lowest, and the thing is changing. Well, the Reagan budget inflection occurred in 86. The impact occurred in 96. And it's still with us today. Yeah. Uh, we had a coalition. The coalition worked because of uh, the leadership of the president, and he worked with the other national leaders. And it worked because Schwarzkopf, uh, we, when Schwarzkopf was still in the States, I talked to him every day, and we decided we needed a non-US leader. And so we were able to get uh, Prince Khalid bin Sultan, who was a three-star in Saudi, he was a prince. And the Saudis are the big brothers of GCC, although they uh, that's not like, you don't say that, but it, uh, uh, they pretty well know that. And so we had Schwarzkopf and Khaled as co-equals. And that gave a route for non-US forces. If they wanted to have an, a spokesman at the highest level, they had none. Now, as it turned out, Schwarzkopf and Khaled got along. They had violent fights from time to time, because both of them had huge egos. On the other hand, they both uh, did a great job and, and deep friends. Um, we had trouble with the French Minister of Defense. He liked the Iraqis, he hated Americans, and so he got fired. Uh, we had uh, trouble with Canada because they had an element in their headquarters that didn't want the F-18s to fight. And they sent an admiral over to be their head guy, and he didn't want the F-18s to do anything but don't fly over his two ships were in the Arabian Gulf. And so when he came to see me, he told me that's what we're gonna do, and I told him, uh, no, they're not, they're gonna fly Defensive counter air and counter air. And then eventually, when it came time, there, they, we didn't need the counter air anymore, so they, we didn't drop bombs. And he said, no, they're not. So I was scheduled to go to dinner that night, sat next to the Minister of Defense from Canada, and I said, boys, your Air Force gonna look stupid after the war. So I said, why's that? And I said, it's because we wanted to drop bombs, and your people don't want to drop bombs. Next day, they were dropping bombs. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the British, the British love ROE. Uh, it's the way the politician protects himself from military doing something stupid. And in Vietnam, ROE caused us to lose our integrity in the military. Because we had the ROE, and you go up north and you get about 10,000 bullets shot at you, and 10 SAMs, and four NIGs, and pretty soon it's tough ROE. You uh, went and killed what you had to kill. And when you do that, you lose your integrity, and I swore I'd never let my integrity go. So uh, we didn't have our this one. We had laws of armed conflict, and we had rules with regard to what you could shoot down because we didn't want to have uh, fratricide. But other than that, flight leads were responsible for doing the moral, ethical, and appropriate thing. And uh, the British were very upset about that. So the first uh, commander they sent down there was an Air RAF officer. And he came in to me and said, hey, oh, I say, about the ROE. And I said, well, Sandy, what do you want to do about it? He said, well, it's very important. I said, OK, fine. What do you want to do? Well, you must understand that uh, we need good ROE. I said, Sandy. And I'm just, and I said, Sandy, what do you want to do? Well, uh, uh, well, it, it's so important that we must address it. And I said, Sandy, tell me what you 
you want to do. This went on for a half an hour. And finally, I said, Sandy, if you can't tell me what you're going to do, get the hell out of here. He said, no, I, I said, you can take your Air Force with you and go home. He said, I don't know, that's a bit strong. I said, well, yeah, tell me what we need to do or get out. He left. And I looked over and my deputy, Tom Olson, was in the same office somewhere in the far corner. He was literally lying on the floor, <laughs> holding his sides flat, <laughs> silently. And, uh, and I said, I don't understand. He says, no. he's been a native lot. He says, you got to understand the British politician. Mm -hmm. So what happened is there was a British four-star Air Force in London, in London, and so the politicians in the MOD would tell this British officer, you need to do this in the ROE, and he says, get right on it. <laughs> and throw it in his desk. <laughs> and so I'm eternally uh, thankful the guy won't mention his name, because they might put a head out on him. <laughs> uh, the Vietnam experience was fundamental to Desert Storm. <clears throat> Uh, I talked a little bit about ROE. Uh, the other thing was uh, we had some problems. Uh, we hit the El Frigo's bunker, and it turned out to be a bomb show. And we wouldn't have hit it if we'd known. Uh, they wanted to have an investigation. I said, no, the pilot did exactly what he was told to do. And he put the bombs exactly what he was told to do. That's it. We made a mistake. Uh, we hit the milk factory. Uh, I didn't think that was a big deal. Uh, the electrical grid. The best debrief I had about Desert Storm came from a piece of The guy had been an Army intelligence officer, gotten out and become anti-war, violently anti-war. And Saddam Hussein learned about him. So after the war, he invited him over to Iraq, gave him the run of the country so that he could come back and talk about the horrible things that are there. Well, the trouble is, this guy has integrity. So he went over and he took six or eight hundred bullets in the And he, he said, uh, why did you hit the milk factory? And I said, because we thought it was uh, something other than the milk factory. He says, let me tell you, it was a milk factory. I said, but it was camouflage and then fence around. He says, all the buildings in Baghdad are camouflage and then fence around. And then he, uh, he said, uh, I want to thank you because I saw very little unintended damage. He said, in fact, I was amazed by it. But he said, the one thing you should have done is taken out the electrical grid. And I said, well, we want to do that to embarrass Saddam Hussein. He said, embarrass Saddam Hussein? How are you going to embarrass him? He shoots his people and sends the family to build for munitions. He said, you cannot embarrass Saddam Hussein. He was right. And we probably should have taken out the best we could at the time. Uh, metrics. <clears throat> Vietnam metric body count. And uh, we were all sick by that because that's what we see. So uh, I was worried about metrics. Bill Preach taught us to measure output, not input, not activity. And so uh, we could, I'd get the guy said, you're not putting enough holes in the runway. I said, that's not the metric, holes in the runway. The metric is how many of our airplanes get shot down or have to jettison their bombs because of the enemy interceptors? The answer is zero. I said, that's the metric I want. And uh, other metrics were uh, generally round around. And I get a lot of heat from people. Oh, well, you got to do this. How many people do you kill? And Schwarzkopf and I were never going to tell anybody how many people we kill uh, just because of Vietnam. Now, it makes it hard for the people back home because they want to see progress. They want to see something happen. But when you have a president who has faith in you, and a secretary of defense has faith in you, then uh, it makes it a lot easier, a lot better. The Vietnam experience in targeting uh, is a big thing with me because I flew in North Vietnam. And there we have, we go by perfectly good targets to hit perfectly ungood. And so I determined that we would never decide on a target except in theater. And that was fine. I didn't care where the information came from. I'll take information from anybody. But it's going to be the black hole that determines what we hit and don't hit. And then we're going to get that approved by Schwarzkopf. And so every night, Buster and I would get in the car, and he'd tell me all he was doing that on the road <coughs> down the street to the JCS headquarters. 
and we talk about a strategy how we're going to fight to give the brief and uh, every night we did that. Another thing about sports club, you never spoke to him in public. I wouldn't even say hello to him in public. If you spoke to him in public, it made him nervous because then he'd think he'd have to make a decision about something in open. Uh, and so when I, in meetings, I either whisper in his ear or I'd write him a note. I would never say anything in meetings. And I could go up to his office, close the door one time, I went up and I said, you're the dumbest, and I use pretty bad language, I'm sorry, Chad. Um, person I've ever met, general I've ever met. And he said, oh, why is that? I said, because of this. And I showed him the letter that had come his headquarters, signed in his name, not for he didn't sign it. He looked at it and he says, you're absolutely right. He called the guy up. I never had another problem with that guy. Probably <laughs> toast. But uh, uh, the biological target was one where I, I learned something. Uh, they had anthrax and botulism stored in refrigerator bunkers. Uh, Janie came over in December, and we were scheduled for 15 minutes of discussion. That day. Uh, the people in the room, myself, briefing, sports golf, Cheney, uh, Powell, and Wolfowitz. And I briefed what we'd done, and Buster worked out a good plan, put uh, break, crack the bumpers, and put incendiary in there. And then he did them, I thought it was kind of stupid. He uh, wanted to put landmines in there so that we blow the legs off people so they wouldn't get infected with anthrax. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I briefed his plan. <coughs> And of the Cheney did the question. Schwarzkopf never said a word. Powell and uh, Wolfowitz were against it, hitting the bunkers. I leaned towards hitting them because I wanted to have the initiative, not let the Iraqis have the initiative. That stuff. Of course, the problem is, once you blow the spores in here, the, the scientists all have to go an equal distance. And I knew enough from watching the smoke on the field. They're going to go down. The field's over hit with the southern wind. Uh, Anyway, we were eating green. The brief for three hours. And finally, I realized that Wolfowitz was so pro-Israeli that I said, you know, there's got to be a penalty for a country that builds these horrible weapons and stores them on their soil. Uh, so if we do kill innocent people because of the attack, uh, that's got to be a penalty. And Wolfowitz immediately changed his vote to let's hit the bunkers. And so now Powell's alone. Powell does not like to be out on point alone, and so he quit arguing. And Cheney's turned to Schwarzkopf and says, Norm, what do you think? And Norm said, well, you know, you know. And finally he looked at me and like we went on the next subject. So we hit the bunkers. Now fortunately, the Iraqis had taken the anthrax and possibly not destroyed. But I got to thinking, I said, you know, if there had been stuff in there and a lot of people got killed, they'd have me in handcuffs, the world court in Belgium. And I said, you know, that's the penalty you pay for being in charge. So if you like being in charge, be prepared to pay the price. And uh, I got I got to thank uh, Schwarzkopf for that one. Things we did poorly. Uh, our reconnaissance was not it was film based, and a lot of our targets were to destroy the mechanism by which the Iraqis could inflict casualties on us. As it turned out, that really didn't matter. The tanks and artillery we did a good job. What really turned out to be the strategic center, and I use that word, strategic, the center of gravity for the Iraqis is the Republican Guard. Now, General Wafiq was with Saddam Hussein all during the campaign in a residential area. And uh, when they, uh, Saddam Hussein didn't care about the country, he didn't care about the soldiers, he didn't care about his army, he cared about the Republican Guard because that's the only way to keep the Shia and the Kurds in check. And Saddam Hussein wanted to stay in power. So he was doing fine until the Republican Guard started to attrit. And Wafiq said, he was, and on two nights before, he, before we quit, he was crying like a baby because he was terrified. And remember, he offered to withdraw from Kuwait before the ground war started. And Powell said, oh, we can't allow that. He had his army attacked. So that was the reason for not 
and you know, we, he wanted to, I think, six weeks or something like that to pull up. And uh, the answer came back, says, no, you got to pull up tomorrow. He said, well, you can't. He said, well, the word was on. And so when we stopped the hostilities, which we did, uh, Saddam Hussein became euphoric. He won. We didn't, see, we, we mirror image our enemies, which is a big mistake. They're different. They think differently. They want different things. And so you got to put yourself in the other guy's shoes in order to develop a plan and know what you're doing. And uh, well, Fink says, boy, when uh, we quit, he's, he, that's why he said, we won. And he went on the air and talked to people about, we won, we won, we won. So I had everybody flying supersonic around Baghdad for about two weeks, just to remind him <laughs> if he won, uh, he would not won for a big. Of course, the F-15 was hated. We did cyber ops, very important. Um, we had a very good opportunity, and because of lack of interagency coordination, and I learned this, don't ever ask permission. Just do it and, and apologize afterwards. And that is the biggest stumbling area we're going to have in future conflicts, cyber operations. Because first of all, it's way too classified. And second of all, people who uh, have a yang-yang between the intelligence community and the ops community. And the intelligence community want to exploit, and the ops community want to jam or destroy or and people don't talk to each other. And so, uh, and space, space is a huge cyber player, and they're gonna do it both in the theater and out of the theater. Well, theater commanders don't like things being done out of the theater. So we've got to start exercising space, uh, cyber operations. We've got to start talking to each other. We've got to lower classifications, because believe me, everybody else is doing it. And uh, so, uh, I'm very, very, very worried about cyber operations. One of the first things we did was exit planning. We said, we're here to win the war. Now, the war is on the end of We said, what now? And they said, well, you have to go talk to the enemy and sign the peace. We are not peace people. We are killing, destroying people. And so they said, well, Sorshaw, go up there and make the peace. Sorshaw says, I don't want to do that. And we sat in his office and he got a sheet of paper out what the hell am I going to talk to him about? And so we put POWs in my first and foremost because of our Vietnam experience. And then uh, how to keep, how to separate the forces so we don't start shooting each other again and stuff like that. But uh, that meeting at Safwan really didn't go very well. Uh, but that's, I blame the interagency process for that. And, uh, the other thing is, exploitation and tele-exploitation. After the war at Toledo Air Force, there's a brand new top line Soviet fighter sitting there on the roads. And uh, some of the guys went around shooting full of holes with a 45. And some of the army guys throw a grenade in the cockpit. And we could have put a C5 on that runway and you take the wings off and we'd have a whole uh, experimental air force to deal with to exploit. And we hadn't even thought about that. And, uh, so if you're in tell, Take notes and do something next time. The thing I uh, was worried about was presence in the AOR. Now, Schwarzkopf really got upset. And I said, well, OK, we're going to send the uh, 111s back to Lake. So I call up at 9 in the morning, 111s back to Lake. At 2 o'clock, the ramp be empty. Well, he was upset about that because the Army guys, it had taken four months to get out of the desert, three months to get organized to get going home. And so he saw that as a uh, being mean to the army. <laughs> but boy, if we had any unit to go home, they were gone. I mean, there was like a vanishing one. And in fact, I sent my whole staff home, except for myself and Bull Baker and some other people, uh, because we were going to fight again. And uh, but I couldn't find them. And he wouldn't let any of the motor commanders go. I had some problems with the first admiral who was there, a guy named Hank Moss. And he wanted to do root packages. And I said, Admiral, if we do group packages, I will resign right now. And he was in shock. Uh, he was imperial. And for some reason, the Navy put the hook on him and sent over a guy named Stan Arthur, who, like me, is overweight and kind of homely. And, <laughs> and in Vietnam, he's a lot of combat. He was talking about. 
Okay. Are there, we only had one disagreement, and that had to do with the requirements to shoot air to air. Because the F-14s only had radar. And so if they couldn't get a radar and a visual, they couldn't shoot. And or the F-18s and the F-16s and the F-15s all had mobile sensors. And uh, so I said, Stan, go present your case to Swartz Trout. It will not hurt my feelings. It's right that we put the position up there. So we went up there and briefed Swartz Trout. So a little while later, the Swartz Trout said, Chuck, come see me. So I went up to his office and he said, so, what's this about Stan right there wants to do? And it put the onus on me to argue his case, his case hey, as nice as I could. And so I argued his case just as forcefully as I possibly could. And he said, well, what's wrong with that? And then that gave me the opportunity to give him a counter argument. He said, you decide. <laughs> <laughs> we had another case. Uh, it was an integrity issue. Uh, we flew. Uh, 33rd wing jets chased two Iraqis into Iran. And nailed them both 40 or 50 miles inside the country. Now in Vietnam, they replot the shoot down. But uh, the wing call up says, good news, bad news, there's nothing. So I made it all sorts of good news, bad news. And I knew he'd call Cheney. So I'm sitting there that afternoon in the GACC. I said, you know, the Secretary of Defense for Women's Voting Rights is going to say, we got to help in the field. And they're going to send out a staff summary sheet up to Cheney. And it's going to say, we need a buffer zone along the border. Vietnam. And so I looked at the map, and there's no room for a buffer zone. And so I, first of all, started thinking all the arguments, and then I realized that I go to the main end, I'm sort of say, Chuck, go off the office and say, uh, about this uh, shoot down in Iraq, uh, uh, I got some, uh, secretary thinks maybe we ought to put a buffer zone up. And I said, oh, no, no, no. And then he'd say, well, Chuck, it's all very interesting, but just do it. And so what I did is I flipped the sheet up and I wrote my letter of resignation. And I hated it because here I was at the height of my Air Force, uh, my military career. But what had happened is, in Vietnam, I was always angry at our leadership for not standing up to the Latin Americans. And I said, those, and I used pretty foul language, people need to, they let the troops down. Well, the trouble with pointing your finger at somebody, you got three fingers pointing right back at you. And I said, crap. And so that's when I wrote the uh, letter of resignation. But I went that night, nothing happened. Went that night, nothing happened. Went that night. Uh, we were at Washington at a stamp unveiling for Desert Storm and Cheney was there. I said, Mr. Secretary, did you hear us shooting up about us shooting down the two Iraqi things in Iran? Yes, he said, well, she hadn't done that. I said, did you uh, hear anything about it? He said, well, as a matter of fact, I did get a staff summary sheet. How many things we could do? And I remember I wrote on the bottom, they'll know what to do in the theater. So, no, if somebody here to say something bad about Cheney, they meet me out back. <laughs> because he really took the pressure off us. And he kept a lot of pressure on Powell. And I think he did that just to me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway. Death Storm was overhyped. And the reason was is because, first of all, the American people had low expectations. They had Vietnam as their standard, and it was such a morass and disaster that, that uh, they thought that was uh, the way we were into it. The second thing is they were ignorant and unaware of our advances in technology. And so, Schwarzkopf, God, he loved showing those pictures. The, you know, the luckiest man alive, Bob had the red red guys on the And that made his day. Oh, he loved and uh, you can thank John Ford, who just passed away. He was the head of combat camera. Uh, the low cash space was a big thing. And then I think the American, I sense this in the, all the festivities after the war, the Americans had a hangover because of the way they had treated 
military as a result of all the negative things in Vietnam. <laughs> so suddenly now, they want to do a tone. They wanted to uh, feel uh, relief from uh, uh, what they knew inside themselves was probably not, not the right thing to do. And so uh, that's why I think that we were, uh, <coughs> we benefited unusually well from Desert Storm. And so we got to be a little careful about uh, hiding it too much. Uh, Tony McPhee, God love him. After the war, Powell said, track Powell said, Tony, how much do you go on national television and tell everybody how wonderful air power is? And we pleaded with him not to do that because that'd be crowing, that'd be boasting. And Tony, God love him, he loves the Air Force, he loves air power so much, and we kept sending him the data he needed, and he, and he got on television, and he did that, and it just set, reversed all the inroads and uh, then what happened is Tony agreed with uh, the Army Chief of Staff to have a conference at Lovemore. Just, you know, just by his agreement. Well, the Army, first of all, after the war, the Army generals all met in Rio. And they had a meeting with the thing of how do we get control of the air when we're in charge. They were, they were very upset about it. So not all of them, but some of them. And they went through this, and it was all secret, secret. Nobody knows. Nobody. Well, they wanted on a film. Well, guess who took the pictures? The combat camera. <laughs> so the Air Force guy behind the television thing recorded the whole thing. He said, "Sir, I want to give you this for your review." And I looked at it. I thought, "How did they?" Uh, now it wasn't very well. I'll tell you that. The Army Korean generals uh, really they appreciate what our party do, and they understand the importance. Having an air campaign plan that's, that's not necessarily tied to the ground. But anyway, he's brought to Leavenworth. Well, Freddie, what's his name, gets up and he starts complaining about how he got no support. Without, uh, 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 well, I'm sitting way in the back row. And, you know, I, I'm not going anywhere near Air Force anyway, so I may as well say what I mean. So I got up and threw the bullshit like that and started in on him. Da, 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 da. And my aide was in the room across the hall with other aides, and he said, somebody all of them got up and left the room. I came along. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm really hot now, and I'm going for that power. <laughs> and finally, uh, uh, Tony and the chief sat there and said, well, let's take a break. <laughs> <laughs> so I felt like a Martian force field around Because <laughs> everywhere I go, everybody goes. <laughs> 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 part of the Red Sea. And so I'm standing there, and I'm looking at an old Civil War battle flag that's hung in the hall. And Carl, uh, Bob Ruskowski, who's the four-star in Korea, comes up to me and says, keep it up, and need it. And so uh, it is not uniform for the Army, but there are things in the Army. For example, they define wars around force against ground wars. That's why it's called a four-day war around the ground war. Uh, and so if they want to live in Alice in Prairie Land, that's fine. <laughs> But you better stand up to them if they're, if they're doing something that doesn't make sense. And doctrine is the word that often defiles common sense. So we, didn't, we were never allowed to use the word doctrine in our briefings. And it went uh, well that way. Now, what have we learned? Uh, probably not very much. <coughs> Political level uh, appears not to be able to function in the current combat situation we have. And it might require a very hard decision. We walked over to Vietnam. A lot of people died because we walked away. A lot of people went into prison camps. I hosted uh, the family of one of them. And he came out in November of 90. Uh, but uh, now the first campaign in Afghanistan. Right on target. Special operations force on the ground, air power, indigenous ground forces. We punished the Taliban. We said, you hosted Al Qaeda, here's your punishment. Now, we're leaving. If you do it again, we'll be back. Uh, and 
and stay if we stay. And what happens is, when we stay on the ground, we become invested in the conflict. And essentially, these conflicts are often nothing more than civil wars. The North-South Vietnam was a civil war, backed by the Cold Wars, who were fighting uh, a control war and a containment on our part. And now, after the capitalism versus communism, the capitalism lost, and now we have a communist Vietnam with a capitalistic government, capitalistic uh, economy, because they couldn't sustain the economy. So uh, uh, the political side of military is probably the most important element. It's the starting element. It's the one that makes the difference. And often, we don't think it through. Uh, I I'm not sure what the joint and what the chain of command is in our current conflicts. It was very clear what it was in Desert Storm. Everybody knew who they worked for. And uh, everybody was in it together. And uh, we, I, I, if I had to sit down and draw a line of how things organize now, I don't think I could do it. Now, I realize a lot of these remarks are based on ignorance. And I, I don't mind being ignorant. I've been that way my whole life. <laughs> Uh, what kind of ROVP do they have? I shudder to think about it, and I shudder about who's in charge of what. Their targeting strategies, uh, the coalition operations, I, I really like no other coalition operations. Uh, we were in the era side, as a coalition, we were locked still. And, and it didn't matter what country you came from, big or small, you were an equal partner. And we would sit down at night and, and work that way. And they had access to anything we were doing at the black hole. And, uh, we were prepared. We were organized. Goldwater Nichols was fundamental to that. And uh, we had tremendous support from everybody. People, uh, Bob Russ, my four star Air Force pilot, called me up and said, Chuck, I've got a call now. I got a call and called from the air staff and they said, uh, What's your rotation policy? He says, We're here to we win. He says, oh, no, you can't do that. I said, I was in Vietnam. When you start built up, you're thinking on how long you're going to be in the theater. Is your goal to get these get out of jail calendars? And just take them. I said, we're here to move on. Some of the guard guys didn't like that. But they got to go on first. Uh, let me stop and see if any questions. I don't know if I remember. <laughs> I did. <laughs> well, I'll be around and asking questions later.